Well, uh, Peter Sutton is a well-known specialist in Dutch and Flemish art. Uh, he graduated from Harvard, then did his PhD work here at Yale, a student of Egbert Haverkamp Behemann, who's now 91 years old and the patriarch of our field. Also the teacher and the, or the coach uh, of at least half a dozen leading curators and scholars of Dutch art, including Ronnie Baer of the MFA of Boston, uh, who's going to come here and you'll hear next week. Peter Sutton has been one of that small band of American curators who's played an absolutely essential role in teaching the wider public about the art of the Netherlands. Peter's preferred method uh, is ambitious exhibitions, uh, as for example, the Age of Rubens, uh, Masters of Dutch Landscape, and Dutch genre painting in the Age of Vermeer. There have been many specialized shows as well that have expanded what we know and think about particular artists, uh, among others the painters Peter de Hoog, Michiel Sweerts, and Jan van der Heijden. He's also cataloged some very fine private collections, including those of Lord Har Harold Samuels and Baron uh, Willem van Dedem, and most recently the Hoogenbuchau collection. Well, after Yale, uh, Peter was a paintings curator at the Philadelphia Museum, and at the MFA in Boston, was the director of the Wadsworth Athenaeum, and had a stint at Christie's as senior director of Old Masters. For the past uh, dozen or so years, he's run the Bruce Museum in Greenwich. Uh, Bruce's, uh, Peter's uh, huge uh, reputation uh, and his loan-getting prowess have made uh, the uh, Bruce uh, an unlikely player, you might have thought, on the world stage, a real force in international exhibitions. On top of that, uh, Peter's had a new wing designed for his museum and is now um, remaining, well, working on the remaining details. He was Peter, uh, in fact, who suggested a certain, that a certain uh, well-to-do uh, Boston couple of his acquaintance uh, about 20-odd years ago that they ought to maybe buy some Dutch paintings. I'm talking about Rosemary and Eck van Otterlo, of course, and they did, about 75 of them so far. They've been grateful to Peter ever since, and so has the museum going public. I'm delighted uh, to introduce Peter Sutton. His topic, topic today, as you can see, is appearance and reality in Dutch art. Peter Sutton. Great. Ah. Yes, we go back. We go back. John, 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 John was my predecessor, predecessor as, as curator in Boston. I, 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 then, I then somehow didn't quite get to the Getty, but I, I did have a lot of lateral moves. Um, I'm going to talk today about, about Dutch naturalism, uh, and I'm going to use as many of the Otterloh's pictures as I can, as, as John just suggested. Uh, I started out with the Otterloh's low 30 years ago, I think, not 20. Uh, but uh, it was wonderful. He was then collecting sleighs and, and automobiles, and I said, you know, you could buy, buy pictures. I mean, uh, and, and before you know it, he, he, he came up to me. I was, I was giving a lecture at the Boston Museum, and he came up to me, and he said, he said, should I buy this picture? I said, well, it's a very nice Peter Klaas, but you should buy this Jan Davids to Haim. And, and he underbid it for $750,000. I went, my God, Ike, we have to talk. So, <laughs> So he's, uh, he has, has gone on to much even better things than that, including this, this Rembrandt. Today I'm going to talk about what people react to immediately about Dutch art, that it is highly detailed, uh, that it has a naturalism, a truth to life, a kind of verisimilitude, and a visual probity, it's been called. Uh, and, but I hope, using some of the von Otterloh's paintings, that we'll explore the, 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 the truth of this, of this observation, and I hope to be able to show you the artifice of naturalism, how it is contrived and confected. And I hope at the very end you will come to understand that naturalism is simply another style, like mannerism or classicism. Perhaps the, the, the clearest expression of, of this notion that Dutch art is literal reportage was expressed by Eugène Fromenteau, 
Frumento was a, was a very nice painter, orientalist, uh, and wrote a very good book, actually very well written book, Les Métro d'Autrefois in 1875, and this is what he said about Dutch, Dutch painting. He summed it up. Dutch painting, it is quickly perceived, was and could only be the portrait of Holland, its exterior image, faithful, exact, complete, and without embellishment. Portraits of men and places, citizens' habits, isn't that nice, citizens' habits, squares, streets, country places, the sea and the sky, such was to be reduced to its primitive elements, the program of the Dutch school. Outwardly, nothing could be more simple than this discovery of an art of earthly aim, but until the Dutch painted it, nothing had been imagined equally vast and novel. So let's test that assumption that Dutch art is simply a portrait of the people. This is Elche Eulenburg, who was, who, was a, uh, who was the cousin of Henrik Eulenburg, who was central to, to, uh, to Rembrandt's, Rembrandt's life when he first moved from Leiden to Amsterdam. He was also, she was also a cousin to Saskia, uh, uh, his, uh, Rembrandt's first wife. Uh, it is a wonderful probing portrait of, of an elderly woman uh, and is one of the highlights of the Van Otterloh collection. They also have other wonderful uh, portraits. Here, the Kempenaar family, the Kempenaar family done by Jan Baptist Venix, who is a Dutch Italianate painter, quite different style, but also a wonderfully sensitive portrait of a woman and her children. Other paintings in the collection that, that highlight this marvelous ability to get a human likeness, the debris of this woman in profile, or the, uh, or the, uh, the Gerrit Dow, uh, a self-portrait. There he is arrayed with all of the, all of his, uh, his, the attributes of an erudite painter, uh, painted in a niche, but a very good likeness of, of, of the artist, we assume. Uh, and they also, of course, did marvelous paintings of genre scenes, scenes of everyday life, the quotidian, the everyday be it uh, a family of a family, a simple family by, by Adrian von Ostade, or a, a, a metsu of an old woman having a, a simple meal in her kitchen, or Dao uh, with a woman praying before, uh, before a meal uh, in, once again, in a kind of uh, uh, crumpled down uh, little, little dwelling. Um, and then, of course, the Dutch also created high life scenes. They did the upper classes, too. Uh, it is remarkable. I'm, I'm planning on doing a show called The Merry Company, because the 17th century was the most miserable century. You can't imagine that Europe lost, lost overall population. It had constant war, pestilence, uh, economic collapse. Uh, it, it was a dreadful century. And what did the Dutch do? They created the Merry Company, which was kind of like a compensation for all of this. Everybody got around a table and had a good time. It, it reminds me, we, we have a group of hedge fund people that gather, gather in, in, in Greenwich. And in, 2000, in September of 2008, one of the people asked the panelists, what do we do for goodness sake? The world's, world's come to an end. And one of the panelists finally said, I have three recommendations for you. Go out to dinner with your friends, go to the gym, and don't open your statements. <laughs> That's a merry company. <laughs> they also had a wonderful talent for, for depicting the world around them, be it in a simple still life of roses like this Boschart uh, that is one of the very first flower still lifes in existence and is also in the Van Otterlo collection. Or this fantastic Haida, uh, the Haida that has been hanging here at Yale, and which is a tour de force of, of the observation of simple, of simple objects, uh, be it a rumor of wine, a façon de Venise glass, or uh, a, a peeled lemon, uh, smoking supplies, and perhaps the, the tour de force of the, of, the, of the entire composition is this tatsa that is turned on its side. I, I, I defy you to, to, to draw that correctly in perspective, even in a simple, uh, simple still life like this Aunt Betia, as they call it. They also were very reverential about the landscape around them. It probably had something to do with the fact that they'd just recently won their own independence. So they were very proud of the land that they had, and they've produced 
a marvelous slew of, of landscapists, the greatest of them being, being Jacob Roystal, who did this, uh, this wonderfully chilly uh, view of a lumber yard uh, in the Von Otterloh collection, or the Ostada there, kind of mud luscious uh, a white horse dragging a sledge up from a frozen river in the middle, in the early, uh, in the early thaw. Uh, it, uh, none of it embellished, uh, all of it seemingly, seemingly a kind of admiration for, for the simplest of pleasures. Uh, and and they, they understood that their landscapists were, were, were better than, uh, better than other, other people's uh, landscapists. Huygens, uh, who was the, the, uh, the secretary to the Stadtholder, a very distinguished uh, patron of the arts in his own right, a friend of, of, uh, of both Rembrandt and Levens in Leiden, he wrote, the harvest of landscape painters, as I, as I refer to those who paint woods, fields, mountains, and villages, is so great and famous in our Netherlands that anyone who would, uh, who would uh, attempt to name them all would fill a small book. It can even be said, as far as naturalism is concerned, that in the works of, of these clever men, nothing is lacking but the warmth of the sun and the movement of the breeze. And there is much to be said for that. And, and this would seem to bear out what, Fr Froment, what, what Frometin was saying about this being a literal portrait of, of the, Dutch, the, the Dutch scene and the Dutch countryside. Uh, and some of the pictures in the uh, Von Otterlo collection, like this very early Hans Bol on the bottom, which shows uh, Amsterdam on the, on, the, on the skyline. This is the Amstel River. There are wonderful trek scout here. These are, these are tow barges. I, I once had a, I have a very, very dear friend, John and I, Albert Blonkert, who is, who is slightly older than I am, and he always forgets that he's older than I am. And, he's just, and he, says, he says, says to me, Peter, Peter, we are just trek scouting. We are just those horses that drag these barges forward. And, and, uh, that's the trek scout right there. Uh, that's, that's Albert and me. Um, or this other view from the south of Amsterdam, also of the Amstel by, by Jacob Roystal, shows you how that they could, they could depict the, 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 the scene in a very accurate way. Or this great Bockhausen that's in the von Otterlo collection, which shows it from the eye. It's on the north side. And this is the harbor of Amsterdam in the distance. And all these, these boats are moving under, under a very stiff gale. It all, it all seems quite plausible, and even anonymous still lifes like this wonderful De Flieger, which shows, shows, uh, shows this, this, this wonderful sailing vessel under, under a stiff breeze. It's good to remember that as much as 10% of the male population of the Netherlands was at sea at any given time. This is really was a, a true maritime nation, and, and to this day, uh, the, the, the globe reflects the, the, the breadth of their reach from Spitsbergen to Cape Horn to New Zealand to uh, you name it, Brooklyn. Uh, it's, it's, all, it's all based on the Dutch explorers. But how were these things really made? They were not made in the boat. They were not made en plein air. They were made actually back in the studio. And this is an important, important uh, consideration when you're considering how these things were conceived and imagined and, and constructed. Jan Steen shows us in one of the von Otterlo pictures uh, a painter who's taken a moment out from his painting. He's still holding his, 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 his palette and, and brushes in his, in his left hand, and he's correcting a drawing that a young, a young apprentice is, has been making. It's a drawing after a print and he's making some corrections directly on the drawing. And you realize that, that, that paintings were really made from prints and from mem memory. They were not made on the spot. And this is a very important consideration because there's a lot of imagination that go enters into this when you, when you retreat to the studio. So that uh, we saw the buskart before of the, of the, 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 the roses in a, in a rumor. Here's another Boschart that's in the Maurits house, also in a niche. But all of these flowers are from different seasons. Uh, uh, we, have, we have roses, we have tulips, we have, we have uh, irises, we have, we have uh, jonquils, we have all kinds of things from different times of the year. So obviously they were made from drawings and they all, were all combined into this implausible or impossible bouquet. They did, not have, they did not have kind of jets that brought things from Chile in, in the 17th century. Uh, so 
This is, is an impossible uh, bouquet, but one that is somehow ideal and all about the rotation and cycle of life. Uh, so that it is, it, is, it is something that happens repeatedly in Dutch flower still lifes. And the von Otterlo pictures show you that very clearly. Here is a von der Ast. It too has irises and, and, and roses and, and tulips, all from different periods of, of the year. Or here, a great Jan Davids de Heim, spectacularly beautiful picture, with again with roses and with carnations and with, uh, with morning glories and with sheaves of wheat and currants and, and, and raspberries, all which bloom at different times of the year. And this continues into the 18th century because this, uh, this Rachel Reich here, that's a woman who had 10 children and also managed to be the court painter to the Elector Palatinate. I tell you, there are people that have been, have been multitaskers for a long time. Um, that's Rachel Royce. That's 1704 or 9 or something like that. So this continues into the 18th century. I want to dive into a little deeper into this picture because this is by Solomon Roystal. It hangs, I think, these days in the, in the Rijksmuseum. It is a river landscape. He did many river landscapes. Solomon Roystal was the uncle of Jacob Roystal, also from Harlem. And he specialized in these, these river landscapes that show a diagonal recession, the entire foreground filled with water. He very often had, had, uh, had ferry boats used as a kind of repoussoir to enhance, the, enhance the, uh, the, the recession. And he has these tall trees that lean out over, over the receding river. And very conveniently, he has, he's lined up three vessels, sailing vessels, that, that draw the eye into the distance. This happens again and again and again. Although I might point out that this particular ferry boat is the, perhaps the most companionably overbooked ferry boat I've ever seen. <laughs> Can you imagine, this lady in the middle is actually riding side saddle and wearing a mask. And she's riding with a bunch of, with a bunch of cows in, in a narrow ferry boat. What? This is a very brave group uh, that, that's, that's crossing that river. Uh, but this is uh, 1649, one of the best years of, of uh, Solomon Roystal's career. Now here's another picture by him that is, uh, I think this is in, this is in, uh, this is in Los Angeles. I think it was, a, it was an Ed Carter picture. And we notice that all, many of the same features are found here. We have the ferry boat. We have the, the distant vessels. We have the trees that lean out. We have a road. We have a church. We also have, have this happens repeatedly in, in Solomon's. You have a stork in the, in the, in the chimney of this very good, very good, good omen stork in the chimney. All of these things, and again, the full, the full foreground filled with water. Here's one that just sold to the National Gallery in Washington. It was one of the pictures from the Goudsticker show that we had, the restituted pictures from the Nazi looted art. Uh, again, a picture from the same year, 1649. Here's the ferry boat, again with overcrowded, uh, overcrowded passengers. Here again are the, are the, the vessels uh, enhancing this diagonal recession and uh, castles and churches on, on the hillside. Um, there also are, let me go back to the, to the original one, because I want to give credit to John in all this. Uh, this is a picture I actually had in a show that I did in 1987, and I was, I was leading the Princess Marguerite uh, through the, the show. I always wanted Queen Beatrice, because she was much nicer. Uh, and, but Princess Marguerite, was, they always sent her to, to, to go, through, go through the shows with me. And I was saying, you know, contemporary observers say, that, say that, that Solomon would begin his pictures by sweeping a great brush across the, the horizon so that you get these wonderful windswept effects. And then he would, he would have these clouds that would sweep in and then, then plume up in, into, the, into the upper atmosphere. But I said, a meteorologist, according to a very good article by John, uh, proved that these, this is not the way, way, uh, way clouds actually act. So that these are not real clouds. These are made up clouds. So she looked at me very, very crossly and said, they do in Holland. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, your majesty. And we, and we moved on to the next picture. But here, I, I show you some more of these. 
It's not that these things become formulaic. They are just, each one is, is just as naturalistic as the other one. The astonishing invention of this man is that it never becomes routine. He has all the same bits and parts, but he cobbles them together differently every time. Uh, so that we have pictures here from the Mauritz House, uh, from, uh, from the Franz Hals Museum, uh, and this one also was in, was in the Houtsticker collection. It shows actually Nyenrode Castle in the distance, but that's not a ri the river that goes by Nyenrode. This is all made up. It's an actual place, but not, but not in the right place. So then you have Jacob Roystal. Here's a wonderful view of Harlem uh, by, that's in the Otterlo collection. These are, these are some of the most famous pictures that, that, that Roystal ever, ever did. They're so famous that they're called Harlempia. Uh, everybody has given them a kind of diminutive uh, as, a, as a sign not only of respect but of affection. And they often have more than two-thirds of the, of the, 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 uh, the scene uh, devoted to the sky. The sky has, has the, have these wonderful clouds and, and light. And then the, the dappling of the, of the landscape below often echoes or, and responds and, and has, a kind of, has a kind of conversation with the sky above. Um, I give credit also to another Yaley, um, uh, Jim Burke, years ago, who was the curator of prints here when I was, when I was uh, in short pants. Uh, he, he did a whole study of all the Harlempias and showed that there's almost a 360 degree study of, of Harlem. Uh, that's always St. Bavos there. We'll see St. Bavos again in a moment. Uh, and he showed how, how all these, these images show it from different angles and are quite convincing and, and quite, uh, quite a, a careful, uh, and as it were, a, a portrait in three dimensions of, of the city of Harlem. Here's some more. Uh, there's St. Bavos. Here are the bleaching fields that are on one side of, there's, there's Bavo again. Again, with these wonderful soaring, soaring uh, skies. But here's a picture that's in the, the Otterlo collection, which is a big Roystal with a blasted tree, lots of blasted trees in, in, in Roystal. But uh, arborists have actually told us, and Seymour Slive discovered a lot of these things. He did the big, uh, wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful uh, sainted Seymour, who, who has just passed away. Uh, arborists could tell you what kind of a tree these are. This is not true in most Dutch landscapes. They actually can identify an oak from a from a from a maple from a from a yew, uh, and and uh, and yet this is a very peculiar kind of kind of confection. This this thing we have we have a, a rushing stream. We have a, a rutted uh, uh, roadway that climbs up the hill on the on the banks of the road. We have a mountain. No mountains in Holland, by the way. Um, and we have a church under a soaring sky and blasted trees, as I mentioned. Well, this church turns up elsewhere. Uh, here's, oops, I'm losing my, losing my laser. Uh, uh, the church on the upper left is, uh, is the, in the Gulbenkian collection in Lisbon. Uh, and um, the one on the right is in the Cleveland Museum. It is the same church. It is obviously based on a drawing. And he just plunks this church in wherever he, wherever he feels it, 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 it belongs. Uh, so that is pretty much the same church as that. But this is certainly not the same landscape as that. This is one of these waterfalls. Besides Olympias, he Roystal was famous for his waterfalls. And everybody thought he was actually named for the waterfalls because Roustal means noisy valley. Uh, but he, no, he wasn't named for noisy valley. But, but it was an easy way to remember who did the waterfalls. Um, Roystal um, took advantage, as many, many artists did after, after the Treaty of Munster was signed in 1648. He used the opportunity for freer travel to, to Germany, specifically to Westphalia, to go to Bentheim, Bad Bentheim. This is Bentheim Castle up here. And he traveled there probably around 1650. Uh, I like it, too, that he's traveling, there are two travelers here. As we think, we speculate, and I think there's probably reason to believe it's right, that he traveled with Nicholas Berkham, who was another artist uh, who actually had, had Peter, Peter Klaus was his father and came from this, this part of the world. So he may have been going back to, to, to see, to see um, relatives. But they probably traveled together to Bad Bentheim. 
And he painted then a whole series of images of Bentheim Castle. The greatest of them all, oops, no, I'm getting ahead of myself here. The greatest of them all is this one that is from the Byte collection is now in the National Gallery in Ireland. It shows, it shows uh, the, the castle, Bentheim Castle on the top of this very, very tall, tall, not quite a mountain, but certainly a very substantial hill. All these wonderful, wonderful foliage down below. Spectacular scale on this picture. I, th I think this is arguably Roystel's greatest picture. Uh, there also, though, are, are ones in the Samuel collection and in the, in the Mauritz House, recently purchased by the Mauritz House, only about 15 years ago. Um, and Berkham also did them. Here's, here's Berkham's view. There's Benheim. But for some reason, since he's an Italianate painter, he puts all these Italian peasants kind of marching around with, with her, herdsmen uh, uh, and these ladies who are barefoot. And it doesn't make really sense in Westphalia, but, uh, but he was... He was a specialist in Italian pictures, so he went with, with, the, with the, the staffage that, that brought him. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, this, this would, would seem that, that this was a way of, of showing this monumental, this monumental structure, this, this remarkable, remarkable castle on a hill. And yet, if you go to Bentheim, he made a, he made a mountain out of a molehill. <laughs> this is Bentheim. You can go to Bentheim now. Uh, and it's on a very low rise, uh, and uh, and it's not quite as 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 as, as omnipotent as, as it appears in either either Roystal's or in Berkham's things. But they came back and they wanted to brag about their travel photos, and that was it. Um, this is then a picture that may have turned up in other other lectures. It, it often does. This is perhaps Roystal's most famous picture. It's the the Jewish, so-called Jewish cemetery, which is in Detroit. Uh, and there are two versions, actually, of this picture. One is in Detroit. This is the Detroit version. And this is the, this is the Dresden version. I'll go back to give you a little bigger image. It is an image with a rushing stream, with blasted trees, once again, a broken tree here crossing the stream, and tombs, tombs that are actually based on a Jewish cemetery outside of Amsterdam which still exists. It has Egmont Castle here, and it has a, a rainbow. It seems very likely that this, as Goethe speculated, and everyone since him has speculated, probably an allegorical picture about landscape painting. Uh, and you see, these, these tombs really do exist. Roystal went out and made, made drawings of them, which were in turn were, were turned into prints. Uh, these are the tombs themselves. It's a photograph of the tombs. He also made drawings of Egmont Castle, which had been part of the recent hostilities with Spain. The Sp Spanish had occupied the castle and it had been knocked down after their siege. Uh, so he brought that, the ruins of this castle together with, with the, the tombs. So it probably has, it, it may have something to do with, with transience, with vanitas, with the hope of renewal through, the, through the, the rainbow. There are all kinds of theories about this. But Egmont isn't anywhere near the Jewish cemetery. So this is, this is completely made up, uh, this juxtaposition of these two. Uh, so once again, uh, uh, there's a lot of contrivance in the naturalism of Dutch pictures. And here's a work by, oops, I think I got ahead of something. Oops, I, I lost one. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, well, uh, we, can, we can do this anyway. Uh, this, uh, this is a, a work by Albert Kuyp, Albert Kuyp. Uh, worked in Dordrecht uh, and, and seems not to have ventured pretty far from Dordrecht, but he did these wonderful, wonderful images that look like they're in the Apennines or somewhere in the Alps. This marvelous, marvelous pastoral image of a rider and several herdsmen with their cattle, uh, a little hunt, hunter right here about to shoot these ducks. And these look suspiciously like the foothills of the Alps, and this a kind of a kind of lake. Only he never went to Italy. Uh, he got all of this from people who had. How you would do this secondhand is one of the miracles of Dutch painting. Uh, that that uh, Jan Bot and Aslein went to Italy, brought back this golden light and this marvelous atmosphere of the Mediterranean, and miraculous, uh, miraculously, uh, uh, Kuyp was able to uh, uh, absorb it and make it completely plausible in his, in his landscapes. This is a fantastic one that used to be in the Butte collection. Um, other ways in which, in which uh, Dutch artists 
as it were, let you peek under the mask, uh, sometimes they would actually have kind of theatrical figures that would act like a, a dramatic a dramatic actor walking out on the proscenium and actually d addressing, the, uh, addressing the audience. Here is a, a, a gent who's, who's had a little too much wine, fallen asleep, and the, I think it's probably the, the, the tavern hostess, who is picking his pocket and, sh and shushing you as you go up. This is, again, in the Otterlo collection by Nicholas Maas. Uh, this uh, became a kind of fascination with Maas. Maas uh, did it again and again and again. <laughs> and uh, always with a shushing, and always directly looking at, at the viewer. This kind of breaks down the, 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 the premise that, 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 the, art, that, 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 that the, the painting is actually a, a view into an adjacent world. If, if, the, if, the, if the actors can see you, you certainly are, 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 are not looking into, into a, a realistic situation. Um, so uh, usually they're, they're, uh, they're, they're, um, they're maids who are telling on other maids who are, who are having a little dalliance in the basement with their boyfriends. Uh, this is the same case there. Or they are, they are exposing the, the mistress of the household having a hissy fit. Uh, as, uh, and often they stand on a, on a, 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 a spiral staircase, which was, which was one of the hardest things to paint and which was a kind of tour de force uh, virtuoso detail in any picture that you, you included. In this case, this is a picture from the Samuel collection, which also has, uh, has a trompe l'oeil uh, curtain in front of it. So it's as if you're looking at a picture that she's looking out at you. The multiple, uh, multiple contrivances of this uh, and, uh, are, are, are to be pondered only by philosophers. Um, this is then the Van Otterlo's Sonradam. This is of Saint Bavo. We were looking at Saint Bavo on the on the, the in the, the Harlempias a moment ago. This is Saint Bavo's nave. This is a picture of 1660. It's actually based on this drawing of 1627. It's amazing. Sonradam would keep drawings around for 30 years and then and then I'd do them again. Uh, this this uh, particular drawing of 1627 was was used the follow the year following uh, 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 his his uh, use of it. In um, it was engraved by Jan van der Velde and was included in Samuel Amsing's uh, description of Harlem. And there is the print right there. Um, but look at it, but, and it was also used, oops, it was also used for this wonderful picture in the Johnson Collection in Philadelphia, which again shows the, shows the nave of, of St. Bavos. This is a picture a year later than the drawing. But to wait 30 years to do this other one and to have this soaring difference in the perspective, this is, he's d deliberately manipulated the perspective to make, make the, uh, the, the, the monument even more magnificent than it is. Um, he did this repeatedly. Uh, here's a drawing of, uh, of 1635 uh, that he then used in the largest picture that he ever did of St. Bavos. This is the one that's in the National Gallery in Scotland. It's 1648, and it shows the crossing of the, of the church. And again, he has exaggerated the height of the ceiling by moving the columns forward and by taking a lower point of view, uh, so that once again, adding to the magnificence of, of the church itself. Or here, uh, about the same time, this is a painting uh, in Worcester that is dated the same year as the von Otterloh picture, 1660. It too is based on an earlier drawing in Weimar of, of the choir. Uh, and you see he's taken, again, he's taken, taken the, the choir, oops, sorry, sorry. He's, oh, I, what's wrong with me? There we go. Um, trying to use the laser, there's the laser. You can see that this kind of squat and, and horizontal perspective has now become this soaring vertical perspective. So uh, deliberate manipulation of spaces. Sometimes um, drawings must have hung around. Uh, this is a painting by Dow that I showed you a moment ago when I was talking about genre scenes in everyday, everyday life that were depicted by the Dutch in such, uh, such, such uh, faithful ways. Um, it, has, it has a little dog here next to a stone jug, a glazed stone jug. Uh, we don't have any drawings by Dow, uh, but he must have had a drawing of this because five years later, in a dated picture of 1650, that one, the before, one before was 1645, he did this little dog. It's a fantastic little picture that we had, uh, we borrowed for, for a show that we did on dogs in art. 
it was, a, it was really fun. We did it with, with Houston. Uh, uh, and uh, this was the highlight. This was the poster, poster child of dogs in art. Uh, it's, um, it is a magnificent little picture, but, and probably inspired by an etching that, uh, and a drawing that, that, that Rembrandt made. It was, he's kind of doing it in competition. But it is a wonderful little, little, little piece. And, uh, and you, is, you can see how he recycles things. And artists did this constantly. Or here, I was looking for this earlier. I, I guess it got misplaced. Uh, this is a work by, early work by Albert Kuyp. We just saw the Kuyp, the Kuyp of, of the, the view of Italy that he'd never seen. Uh, this is one of his earliest pictures. This is Orpheus charming the animals. Uh, and Orpheus, of course, plays. And then all the animals uh, are suddenly, suddenly meek and, and very pliant. Uh, uh, he has wonderful animals. He has, he has a, a camel, and he has an ostrich, and a, and a, and a uh, and an elephant off in the distance. But in the foreground, he has these two wonderful leopards, uh, and these leopards were inspired by a painting that his father had done, that's now in Zurich. And this leopard is that leopard right there. Um, so he was he was working with his father. His father probably did not paint these leopards. These this painting, I've examined it quite closely. It hangs now in the Boston Museum. And, uh, and I think he was probably working, working from drawings that his father had made, because this, uh, this, uh, this bison over here and this, and this goat are both from a series of etchings that his father made of, of various animals that were, that were engraved. Um, back in the Middle Ages, when I was at Yale, uh, I, I, did, I did a dissertation on Peter de Hoog. Who is, who is a Delft painter and who is best known for his wonderful snug geometric uh, interiors, mostly about, uh, mostly uh, concerning uh, domestic subjects. Here is a mother making a box bed with a little child standing in a doorway. He has wonderful, he has wonderful views to adjacent spaces, very per persuasive perspective, um, and lovely contrajour illumination, light that comes from the back to the foreground, and, and, and effects of atmosphere and, and, and light and, and the, the, the geometry of this almost reminds you of a kind of a Mondrian. Uh, it's, uh, he was, he's a very talented fellow, uh, and I've spent a lot of my life looking after his stuff and glad not to anymore. Uh, but uh, that, th that seems like it's the same, it's the same room. Uh, this is a painting in, in Karlsruhe, and this one is in Amsterdam. Uh, these are two pictures, again, that seem to be the same room. It's, it's a little room with, with mothers and their children. Uh, this is a mom uh, going to, the, to, to the, st the storage pantry, probably to get some beer for her son. You know, I was actually recommended uh, in all the, the health manuals of the period, that you, that you, particularly if they were teething, you gave them beer. Um, um, and this, a view to an adjacent space, again, with, with a little platform uh, for, uh, for getting closer to the light when you were sewing. Uh, but this is probably the same room, uh, uh, although the perspective is a little different. But then. It begins to get all kinds of kind of strange. Uh, here is a picture from 1658 or thereabouts of a woman uh, nursing a child and, the, and her young daughter uh, feeding the dog in imitation of her nurturance. Uh, and here is a picture from probably about two, seven years later that's in the Wallace collection uh, and shows a woman peeling apples. Um, this seems like it's the same room, um, except they would have had done some remodeling. Uh, there, this, this pilaster with, with the cupid on top is, seems to be the same, but something's happened to, the, to these, these coins on the, on the, on the, uh, the, uh, on the, the, the mantelpiece, and the, the tiles have all been replaced. They're no longer diamond-shaped tiles, they're square tiles. Uh, and it's a much more, it's more, much more restrained and classical composition, which is, is a, a change in artistic style that happened just about that time. And, but there are pictures from the same year. These two pictures are both, both from 1658, two courtyard scenes. It shows, uh, it shows a, a, a passageway with a plaque over it. The plaque is from the St. Hieronymus Doll Cluster, which was, uh, and the plaque actually still exists in the Delft Museum, uh, and it probably was a real place. But look at the differences in the space. Um, this arbor has become a shed. There's a new wall here. Um, there's a step. All the bricks have changed. And even the view out the door has changed. This is a courtyard, and this is a canal. Um, so um, 
uh, there's a lot of free associative uh, changing of these things, notwithstanding the fact that they look so naturalistic, each independently. Or here, this is a known room in the town hall uh, with, uh, with Ferdinand Ball's painting in it, with a trompe l'oeil curtain, and this gentleman is actually looking at a, at a picture that's over up the back of our heads. Uh, it's not a, very, not a very long room, but it's, it, it's, he makes it seem even bigger than it is. And it certainly has been manipulated. You even can see, I always love this little detail. You see, do you know about pentamenti? This is a pentamenti. See that dog? That dog used to be right there. You see the ghost of that dog? That dog was in the wrong place, so he moved him over. And of course, de Hoek's signature motif is the backlighted doorway. So he has a backlighted doorway. Only that particular door has always opened onto a closed hallway. So this is completely made up, uh, but it's a real room. People must have noticed this. Um, and this is perhaps most clearly demonstrated by Ike's, uh, by, by the Van der Heydens. Uh, and Ike has one of the best Van der Heydens. This is um, his Vesterkirk, uh, which um, was in its day regarded as the most beautiful Protestant church in all of Europe. Uh, it is where Rembrandt was buried, it's where Nicholas Berkham was buried, it's where Titus, uh, Rembrandt's son, was buried. Briefly, uh, uh, Saskia was buried there, but she was turfed out because he wouldn't pay the rent. Uh, um, but it is, this is the Vester Kirk, this is the Vester Hall, which was, which was a guard room, a guard house. And this, we, even, we even know that there was a butcher's shop right here, and this is the Kaiserskracht right there. So very accurately done. Uh, uh, Van der Heiden was one of the most interesting artists of the, of the period, one of the most creative and, and diversified. He not only, not only did many beautiful uh, cityscapes, he's probably, along with Berkheide, the, the, real, uh, the real pioneer of, of cityscape painting, which was the last of the various specialties of Dutch lands landscapists to, to, it's a kind of sub subspecies of landscape. It's the last uh, specialty to, to emerge. It really only emerges around 1660. He does two other versions of the, the Vesterkirk. And, but he, most of his life is spent inventing the, 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 the street light and the, and the, and the, and the fire uh, hose. He, he actually became the head of uh, Amsterdam street lighting, and he was the, he was the chief fireman of, of, all of all of Amsterdam. And he manufactured these, these, these pumping, uh, pumping uh, uh, vessels and uh, made a lot, of, a lot of money with them. He even illustrated firefighting, uh, uh, firefighting uh, manuals, uh, and he didn't have to have to paint anything, paint to make a living. He painted purely for his own own pleasure, I think. So that when Cosimo de Medici visited him, he didn't have anything to sell him. Can you imagine? I tell you, any other Amsterdam painter would have had plenty to sell Cosimo de Medici. I mean, there were 350 registered painters in Amsterdam. Amsterdam, probably many more that were unregistered. That's twice as many painters as there are butchers or bakers in Amsterdam. They were working on a very small margin of profit. Uh, so um, it, uh, these guys would have been would have. They would have whipped something up for the Cosimo if, if he came to their studio, but uh, not, not von der Heiden. This looks like Amsterdam. This all looks like an area around the Kalverstraat in those years. But, um, but it's probably not Amsterdam. First of all, because there are monks here, and you don't have monks in, 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 in monasteries were, were banned in the Protestant Republic. And this is actually the Jesuit church in Dusseldorf. Uh, and how it's gotten to Amsterdam, I'm not quite sure. But here it is in some other place. This is the Jesuit church in Dusseldorf, but it's now in a different neighborhood, again with, with divines. Um, and now it's changed again. Uh, it has new windows. Those are, that's clearly the top part of the Jesuit. And, and it has sculpture that it didn't have before. Again, we have monks. But the most remarkable thing about it, it has this. That's the cupola of the town hall of Amsterdam. <laughs> How did it get appended to, to the Je Jesuit church in Dusseldorf? Um, uh, 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 van der Heiden lived very close to the new von Kampen town hall, which was the largest public, public uh, neoclassical building in all of northern Europe. Uh, and he painted at least twice, this one in the Uffizi, which, uh, which has, has very strict uh, perspective, and actually used, this picture used to have a little viewing device on it. It had a small ring that you had to look through from exactly the right distance through one eye, and, it, and that corrects 
all the distortions of, of the cupola. He also did a corrected one that's now in the Louvre. Um, but then he did, he used, he used the cupola all the time. Here's an imaginary, uh, imaginary scene with, an, uh, with some kind of Italianate palazzo, and in the background, there's the, there's the, t the cupola of the town hall again. I mean, it, it's one thing if you do a, a city that nobody knows, uh, like Cologne. I mean, here's Cologne, and here's, this is, this is uh, Santa Maria in Capitoline, and this is St. Pantaleon by, by Domer and, and Vinkbones. Uh, but, oops, no, sorry. But here he brings them together. They're not anywhere near each other in Cologne. But he, it's almost like one of those menus you get, you know, that have all the highlights of the town on them, uh, and he just, they just bring them all together uh, for, the, for the purpose of a kind of medley of architectural styles. Uh, so this is Cologne, but done, as it were, conflated. Uh, but how would, it, how would it have come off if you were doing it with, with, in Holland with people who really knew these cities? This is the city of Vera, and this is quite an accurate depiction of, of the church in Vera. Here's Vera, and it has this, this stone wall out there. Then this is Vera, and there's this crenellated wall, and there's several dwellings next to it. But here it flips it. It goes backwards. Here's the crenellated wall, and, there's, and there, are the, there are the dwellings, only it's backwards again. Or here, Vera has come to Amsterdam. <laughs> this is an Amsterdam canal, and there's the, temp there's, there's the, the steeple of, of, of the Vera church. Or here. It's come to some imaginary place. Here's some kind of stone, uh, f stone fortification. Here again is a Baroque palace, and here's Vera up here. Uh, so it is hard to understand what, what people were wanted, wanted from these pictures. Uh, they obviously wanted uh, a mirror of nature, but the mirror, just as, as we all know, mirrors distort things, and they were, I, I guess they were very indulgent with the d degree to which you, you could distort these things. So he even did complete Capricci. Uh, this is, this is a, a, a painting with medieval architecture and with, with a, a Roman triumphal arch, uh, which, uh, which seems very unlikely in, in Amsterdam or anywhere else. Uh, but so these were, these were, were imaginary scenes. Uh, but it, it's a great tradition uh, among landscape painters and among Dutch pictures, painters generally uh, that they, they made these things up. Um, this is perhaps one of the most persuasive ones for this. This is, this is Hercules Sagers, who is one of the most interesting, interesting printmakers and painters of, of the era, that did fantastical landscapes. Um, but, and did this, this one, oops, oops, no, don't want to do that yet. Did this one with an escarpment, a huge cliff, and all these little, these little, little uh, houses, gabled houses at the bottom. Those gabled houses, we know from an etching that he did, were outside of his window, um, so that he actually just plopped the, 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 the view from his window into this imaginary landscape with this rugged escarpment and, and cliff. Uh, it, is, it is a complete fiction. Um, and it reminds you a little bit of those, those wonderful, strange pictures that, that Van Gogh did, another Dutchman, uh, when he was in the asylum. He would paint out of his window uh, all, the different, uh, all the views of the, the, the enclosed courtyard that was his real confinement. Um, I, I conclude then with this, uh, which is a great picture that John bought for the Getty, uh, and which once again reminds us that art, uh, the, the art that the Dutch created happened in the studio. Here's another, another painter correcting a drawing, but in this case he has this wonderful, beautiful young, young female apprentice, and there were important, important uh, uh, woman artists in the 17th century in Holland, uh, and, and yet it is, it is in, this, in this special alchemy that happens in, in the creativity of, this, of the, the studio that these things are contrived, confected, and, and still completely plausible naturalistically. So thank you very much. <laughs>